waiting. It's all good that I'm live. I'm, I'm not alive over here, apparently. Well, this was on earlier. I promise you guys that. Yeah, yeah, apparently. Yeah. Turn me, uh, you need to turn me up a little bit? Oh my goodness. So we're getting back up and on. There we go. Now I can definitely hear myself now. Yep, I have no idea why it decided to die on me, but it did. Life is such, and that's okay. Uh, it should be okay here in just a second. I apologize, people. <laughs> I am not very good at welcoming people or apparently opening the correct program. Uh, so I actually have this really bad, this really bad habit, and, and I have to be reminded, and quite often it's my wife that's reminding me that I will, um, I'm really good at being like, hey, I need this. Oh, and by the way, good morning. <laughs> There's one of my favorite TED Talk people on the planet is Simon Sinek, and one of the things that he really talks about and I've trained myself in is being authentic in who you are and what you want and what you need as opposed to getting all the niceties and letting the niceties of life get in the way of what's actually really going on. And one of the things he talks about is, is, you know, if you want something, I'm in real estate, obviously, and so if you want something and you haven't talked to somebody in a long time, let's not pretend like you're calling him because he was your best friend 30 years ago, <clears throat> that you should call and be authentic and say, hey, bud, I know we haven't spoken in a long time. I'm in real estate now. This is why I'm calling you. By the way, it's been a long time, so why shouldn't why why shouldn't we uh, or why we should go catch up and and get some coffee sometime later? Um, and so taking and applying that to my life, there's a lot of times I forget to welcome people because I'm here for a reason, and unfortunately, it's not to just welcome you. And so I shouldn't say I don't know. Maybe it's fortunate. Maybe it's unfortunate. So. Welcome to those online and here at Bayview Christian Church in person. I have rambled on long enough. The technical difficulties have been, got, been uh, gotten over. And so as you can see from your notes, uh, and you're not going to need those for a little bit, so don't worry about holding on to them. We we're talking about gifts of the Father. I had a really hard time deciding how I was going to name this one. Obviously, I knew it was gifts of the Father, but I couldn't tell if, if we were going to be... I was struggling between saying gift is in a singular gift to the Father or gifts because of the multiple gifts that we talk about. <clears throat> so that was kind of my first struggle. But this all kind of came from a, <clears throat> excuse me, this all kind of came from a story that I got from a buddy of mine. And so recently I had a very good friend of mine tell me this story about his amazing grandmother. And she loved him quite dearly. She was on a fixed income, though, and so she didn't exactly have a lot to spare. And so at a very young age, he can remember like five or six, she, she told him that she didn't have a lot, but that she would make sure that forever she would always give him a Christmas gift because of how much she loved him. There, there was a rule to those gifts, though. And the rule was that if she gave him a gift, it was one gift every year, that if he liked it, awesome. However, if he didn't like it, she'd be happy to take it back from him. But she was so sparing with her money that he needed to know that the following year, that would be the same gift that he received. <laughs> I 
So, before we get too much deeper into this story, you have to understand something. One of the things that really drew me to Roger was the fact that one day we are talking about football, and lo and behold, he's a Bama fan, and I'm a Bama fan. He's a much larger Bama fan than I am. And I was like, all right, great, whatever. He likes Alabama. But then one day I saw him wearing this hat, and I had to double take and look at it, and I was like, he's wearing an Atlanta Falcons hat. I love the Falcons. And so immediately got up, and I was like, you like the Atlanta Falcons. And so it was just became an immediate bonding point to us, and come to find out we have a lot in common. And, um, and so I love him. And so just understanding that Roger is a Bama fan. When I say Bama, I'm talking about the college, the pachyderms, Crimson Tide. So every year for Christmas, knowing how big of a fan he was, his grandmother usually got him some sort of Alabama gear. It was every year it was something new that put a smile on Roger's face. But then something changed in the last Christmas that she was alive. You see, she was also known as being a trickster. She loved to joke and play around with Roger tease him. And it's almost as if she knew and understood that the last Christmas she was going to be here was going to be the last Christmas she was there. She always tried to keep life interesting. And so for that Christmas, that very last Christmas she was alive, she got something for Roger that was extra special. She went out and she got him a gift that he will never forget. She got him an Auburn sweater. Now, my mother back in the back and my wife are listening, and it's only because they know our family. And I had an uncle that graduated from Auburn, and we tried to act like he didn't exist for a little bit of time. But the, the thing is, is for people here in Texas be like you being a UT fan and for Christmas your grandmother giving you a Texas A&M sweater especially as the last gift you give her Roger again remember he's been doing this for a long time he knows these rules he knows these rules very well he knew that if he gave that present back that that would still be the same gift he would have to receive it a second time so later that year, the following year, when his grandmother passed, I assure you that sweater was the furthest thing from his mind, because he loved his grandmother quite dearly. Like when we talked about her, you could see this twinkle in his eye, like this love that he still has for her. And so I asked him when he's telling me this story. I said, "So, did you keep it? Did you decide that it was a special gift?" He had some pretty choice words with the followed with an absolutely not, no. But that sweater, even though, and, and I, I have a strong, strong feeling he was probably lying. He probably does still have that Auburn sweater tucked away in the closet somewhere. But he said it, and when he said it, it was with a smile. It's because it still reminded him of how much he loved his grandmother and how much his grandmother loved to tease him and prod him in life. So it's a little bit of a long story about a buddy of mine and gifts that we receive, and sometimes the gifts are hard for us to understand, and sometimes gifts are not necessarily wanted. We receive begrudgingly. I honestly feel like that in this particular case that Roger's grandmother has some very strong parallels to God when it comes to gift giving. In the last couple of weeks, I've heard a parable about father giving gifts and that if a good father, if a wicked father can still give his children good gifts, then how much better will the Almighty Father 
give to you? Or how much better are gifts will the Almighty Father give to you? Do you really think we spent a long time with Todd on the fruits of the Spirit? So does anyone here really believe that Jesus Christ needed to explain the fruits of the Spirit to Paul so that he could document them for the ages just so that we could live 2,000 years later and decide that that's not instruction we need? that that was just something for back then, that those gifts, those fruits of the Spirit don't apply still today? Or do you think God, being omnipresent, knew and understood that we needed that documented so that we could know the fruits of the Spirit and those gifts so that we could properly use them today and apply them in our lives today? I believe, I'm sorry, if you believe that they were only for 2,000 years ago, I have a hard time believing that you believe in the living word. That would just mean that the Bible's a history book, and if that's really the case, then what are we doing here? So like I said, Roger's grandmother paralleled God so I'd like to kind of get back to that a little bit. Obviously, she didn't believe she was some kind of a deity. But just like I told you, this is God loved the world. Roger's grandmother surely loved him. And also, not every gift that she gave was as great or amazing. But that Auburn sweater that she gave him was something that he could remember her by. And just like Roger, you have to change your perspective on what a good gift is sometimes. You have to ask yourself, why? Why do you have to change your perspective? It's because God only gives good gifts. This has been one of the toughest sermons I've had to write so far. Mostly because the Bible doesn't have a list. There's nowhere I can tell you to go and say, here's a list of God's gifts that you all need to take into account and really honor and cherish and use appropriately. There's no place. You have to actually hunt them down. And still even then, in the Bible, that doesn't say... This is a gift from God. You have to read into the context. You have to understand it. And you have to accept it. When all of them, of course, except for the one that's the most important. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son as a gift. So that one is easy to find. It's all over the place in the Old Testament. It's all over the place in the New Testament, during his gospel, as well as afterwards. The thing about that, though, is <clears throat> without these other gifts, there's no creation, there's no time, there's no space. Without those other gifts that we had to go hunt down or that I had to go hunt down, there's not even a need for Jesus. Well, none that I can readily see with my own eyes anyway. So I started digging in my mind, praying about things that I consider a gift from God personally. The third, first thing I thought about was life itself. We always talk about life itself, right? Tomorrow is not promised that one of the most joyous times in any of our lives is the day our children were born or the day our grandchildren were born. Life itself, and obviously without life, there's nothing. 
Then I started thinking about time. And I thought seriously about, about that sermon where I talked about the clause in a real estate contract that says time is of the essence. <clears throat> and there's a reason for that. Like I said, time is not infinite. It is quite short, at least for each one of our lives. Another reason is I really started to look at time so deeply because our lives are so tied to time. But nowhere in the Bible does God promise you tomorrow. He promises everlasting life through the belief in His Son, Jesus Christ. But even then, time is of the essence. So today, for this particular sermon... There are four things that we're going to talk about being gifts from God. First, foremost, highest in mind for everybody is the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. Number two, in my mind, in my heart, is life itself. Number three is time. And number four is the Word, which is technically the same thing as Jesus Christ anyway. So when I truly think about these four gifts and I'm putting them in this orderly, in this order, I constantly feel kind of befuddled because without all of them, there is no need for any of them. Without Jesus, what's the point? Without life, there's no time. And if there's no need for us to know Jesus, and thus the word is also not needed. Without time, how are we supposed to get to know Jesus through the Word? If you have no time to spend in the Word, how do you get to know Him? How are we supposed to spread the Word, spread His joy, spread His, his life, and go through His great commission? Go through with His great commission, sorry. Which means, with no time, life is just death, eternal. Without Jesus, again, life is just a long fuse waiting for death to come. Time doesn't matter because if life is not really something to live for, it's just time waiting to end. And finally, without... <coughs> <coughs> I apologize, I'm trying to get over this last little bit of sickness. And finally, without the word, written or spoken, how do you come to know Christ? How does your spirit mature through Christ's, through Christ's teachings? And everyone knows, knows that in order to mature, you must have time. And then, if there's no word, and the word was never with God, and the word could not be made flesh. There's no Christ. Leading us down a hopeless road, repeating this same rant over and over again. No. Time is a gift. Just like Christ, just like life, and just like the Word. All of which come from God. And as we said earlier, only good gifts come from God. You can grab your notes now. We're going to hit a couple of scriptures. Matthew 7. I'm going to go through verses 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find it. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you whom when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a snake. Will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask Him? Time is one of those gifts that the Father gave us that can be very deceiving. It is always a blessing, but oftentimes on our earth, we can twist it to look more like a curse. We talk about it in church and with friends. I've never seen any time like this. Nope, things must be coming to an end. Or every day looks more and more like the chances we are really, are really, blah, 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 are really coming to an end and it really does look more and more like the end times. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that if we, as fathers, who we admit are evil and wicked, still only give good gifts to our children, then how much better are the gifts from our Father in heaven? That is, sorry, that is us living in this world and not His works. When was the last time you spent time seeking and knocking? Often I find myself living in this rot most of the time begging God to pull me out of that foul and nasty place. Most of the time, I've, I, have, I have struggled with, with times of depression. But it's only after some time has passed that I remember that the only way out of that depression is to just dive into the Word. Dive into His Word. A little while ago, during one of those tough days... I walked into the grocery store. The clerk asked me how I was doing, and I kind of gave it to him. I told him I'd have better days, but at the same time, I thank God for everything He's done for me, and that I know this too shall pass, more or less. And the clerk, the clerk smiled at me, and he quickly said, Count it all joy. I paused for a moment, and everybody here, knowing that I am a man of answers, said, oh man, I love Paul. The Kirk kind of cocked his head and looked at me funny, and he said, James. <laughs> and I, I said, excuse me? He said, that's, that's James. James 1-2. I quickly rushed out of the, that <laughs> the store that day. <clears throat> yeah, yep, man of answers. <clears throat> Not necessarily the right ones, but definitely a man of answers. So James 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I'm sure at that moment, time, that wonderful gift, stood still long enough for me to look like a fool and cock my head sideways like a curious dog, I'm sure. I tell you what, though, that after that one time in the grocery store, I went straight home and I read James again. Further on in James, he goes on assuring that God does not do the tempting. However, the temptation itself is a good place for us to learn to lean into him. Back in James, 
117, everything, sorry, every good thing given and every perfect gift from, a, sorry, every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So if the four gifts that we're specifically talking about today, Jesus, life, time, and the word, are all gifts from God, then that must be that they are good and that they are only good. And there is no shift in them. There is no variation. There is no shadow. <clears throat> so Jesus received life from the Father through the Virgin Mary. In time, he was tempted and he stood on the word of God. Remember that one sermon when I talked about how every time the devil tempted him, Jesus just replied, it is written. Imagine that for just a second. After his anointing, he was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he finally grew weak and weary and he was hungry, that the devil came and tempted him. And even Jesus stood on the word of God. The Son of God himself stood on the word of God and said, it is written. It's like I discussed earlier, sometimes the word gets a hold of our perception. <clears throat> sometimes the world, sorry, gets a hold of our perception and twists these gifts that God has given us. It's been happening since the dawn of man. The serpent in the garden tempted Eve by twisting the word of God. Surely you won't die. The devil and his minions can do the same thing, lurking in the shadows, dragging out that tick-tock of a clock, seemingly making the dark darker, the light further away, using our earthborn minds against us. The Father may know us better than the devil, but the devil knows exactly how to exploit every single one of our weaknesses. If the devil thought for one moment that he could tempt Jesus, the Son of God, then surely you don't think you are immune. Surely you have more sense than that. A couple years ago, I preached a pretty controversial sermon at Save Savage. <clears throat> Afterwards, there was a lot of division amongst the people in the Save Savage group. But after it was all said and done, I really only cared about the opinion of two men. Neither of them said that they understood the controversy. But one of them specifically said, in fact, I did not feel like you went far enough. So, hey, well, I hope you're actually going to get a chance to watch this one, because here we go. We're going far enough today. The basics of that sermon, and I'm not going to go into it, but are that if you wanted to get closer to God, that you had to be the one who engaged Him. Like we talk about all the time, God doesn't move. God doesn't change. God is here. He's always there. Jesus Christ said He would never leave or forsake you. You have to be the one to turn around and engage Him. So, the more revelation you want, the stronger of a, of a relationship you want, you have to engage him. You have to be there. This, God, this, this actual thought of it's your job is supported in Scripture. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God to... 
<clears throat> excuse me, he who comes to God must, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Time is of the essence. You have to remember that. Every day, in every trench, in every traffic jam, time is of the essence. Yes, if you confess Jesus as your one and only true Lord and Savior, your soul has been redeemed. But that clause, time is of the essence, is there for more than just your soul. It's there for more than just your spirit's redemption. You only have so much time on this earth. You only have so much time to right your wrongs and to truly find your place in the body. And jokingly, but quite honestly, we always say that Jesus has the biggest butt in the world because so many Christians have chosen not to dive in and figure out who they're supposed to be. What good are hands without a thumb? What good is a foot without toes? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read 27 through 31. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles. All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak in, with, with tongues. All do not interpret, but earnestly desire these, greatest gift, these greater gifts. And I show you a still more excellent way. So how do you find your place in the body? What is that more excellent way? Well, Jesus already told us. He did it right there in the red writing. It's where he actually spoke. John 15, 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch dries up. And they gather them up and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. It's a pretty tough statement. So before we move on, let's quickly define abide. Abide is to accept or act in accordance with. So if you do not accept his lordship or act in accordance with his will, are you abiding in him? It's not a question for me to pose onto you, but it's a question that every single one of us should pose on ourselves. It's simple. Does this, whatever it is you're looking at, whatever you're doing, whatever, whatever hurt you're going through, does this glorify Him? And then when it does, John 15, 7 through 11, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. And so to prove to be my disciples, just as my Father has loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, you will abide, sorry, I have abide and abided in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. 
Sometimes when you're in those hard places, that statement, your joy may be full, is a statement that makes me think of good old Lieutenant Dan. <clears throat> Does everybody remember the part in Forrest Gump where Lieutenant Dan ran across some evangelists and the evangelist said, give your heart to God and you too can walk with Jesus. And he freaks out because he has no legs. How is he supposed to walk with Jesus with no legs. We are so short-sighted, so stuck here on this earth, and our brains are stuck in this earth, that we don't even think beyond what we see and know and feel. Blessed are those who do not see yet still believe, right? So how the heck is your joy supposed to be made full if you're depressed? How is your joy supposed to be made full if you're sick? How is your joy supposed to be made full if you're broke and struggling with your finances? <clears throat> if you want to know how, and I shouldn't have to say this, I've already told you that the guy in the grocery store told me, count it all joy. That's right, count it all joy. You keep your head in the Bible. You praise Him for bringing you through the thing, through the place. And that's exactly how you abide in Him. Have you heard me yet? You want salvation, congratulations. You got would <clears throat> sorry, congratulations. You got that when you made him Lord of your life. You want the crap you're living in now? Stick your nose in that book. Read it. Believe it. Live it like you believe it. James four thirteen and fourteen. And this is in the King James, so it's a little bit harder for me. I apologize. Go to, go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get, a, and get gain. Whereas ye know that what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a time or for a little time and then vanisheth away. Time is of the essence. Your life is ticking away one second at a time. You have to be the change. You have to put God first. Not say, put Him... A <clears throat> not say you put him first. You have to put him first. Jesus Christ, life, time, and the word. These are yours. These gifts are yours. I'm sorry. These gifts are yours. But you must be the one to do it. It can't be done for you. In James 1.22, one of my favorite lines, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. One of our first and favorite shirts we ever made here was Chico, 1 Chico 3.5. You do what you believe. Yeah, the rest is religious rhetoric. But that can be applied. You do what you believe can be applied to all things in life. You have to live it like you believe it because you do what you believe. And you will abide in Him and you will receive His joy which in turn 
makes your joy full. Thank you so much for joining us today here at Bayview Christian Church. I hope the message wasn't too tough on anybody. I hope it was just tough enough. So you can find our audio visuals on audio at bayviewcc.org, visuals on both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, this Wednesday, we are going over Mac Lucado, where Lucado, sorry, Lucado, uh, where love and justice meet. At 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. Again, I've already told our people here at church. Remember, November 3rd, that Saturday night, Sunday morning, you were to turn your clock back if you want to be on time for church. If you'd like to help. Our, uh, blah, blah. If you'd like to contribute to our, our uh, ministry, thank you, our ministry financially, please text GIVE to 281-559-6580. That's the word GIVE, G-I-V-E. That's all, folks. Cool. Are we offline?